This is the session for latest uh, technology adoption trends in enterprise blockchain projects. Um, I'm Jim Zhang. Uh, this is Tracy. As many of you uh, know, uh, she's the chair of TSC. I'm one of the TSC members. Um, so a little bit of introduction for myself. Uh, and when Tracy comes up for her part, she will do introduction for her herself. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Kaleido. Uh, at Kaleido, we provide uh, uh, infrastructure for blockchains, uh, both on the blockchain layer, but also on the off-chain components layer. Because we figured uh, since uh, day one at Kaleido that when you build a solution on uh, blockchain, there's many components beyond the blockchain itself. Uh, in fact, uh, we often find that blockchain is 5%, sometimes 10% of the whole solution. For everything else, you have to build uh, a lot of components to make things work together. Uh, so Clido is always a platform that provides not just the blockchain, but also other components to make it easier to build solutions on. Um, so uh, a bit more about myself. Uh, I'm one of the TSC members uh, as of this year. Uh, in the past, before uh, I, I joined or uh, co uh, founded Kaleido. I was part of the IBM team on the um, platform uh, side for blockchain. Uh, I was one of the Hyperledger Fabric maintainers, um, now a retired maintainer on Fabric. Um, I'm also the uh, commercial platforms uh, lead architect for IBM. Um, okay, so in terms of the things that uh, both uh, uh, from our point of view at Kaleido and Tracy's point of view at Accenture. Both of us work with customers quite a lot. Uh, these are the uh, latest trends that we see customers do uh, in terms of getting blockchains uh, into their um, uh, enterprise architecture and solve their own uh, pain points. The first one is tokenization. Um, token, I think, is among, among the few technologies that are universally understood regardless of what blockchain uh, protocols you are part of. Uh, whether you are uh, uh, Ethereum, uh, the whole Ethereum community, there are many protocols under that umbrella. Uh, or Polkadot, uh, Cosmos, Avalanche, whatnot. Even um, uh, Hyperledger Fabric and uh, Besu. Uh, regardless of your protocol, or even Corda, which is not a Hyperledger, but uh, uh, nonetheless a prominent enterprise blockchain protocol, uh, token is something that everybody supports because it's very useful uh, programming construct. So it can be very simplistic. Uh, yet popular, for example, uh, fungible uh, token standards, so you can launch your shiny coins, or uh, mint uh, uh, valuable things in, in the form of non-fungible tokens or NFTs. Uh, they can also be sophisticated things. Uh, for example, you can launch a, a token uh, implementation that models one of the security uh, instruments. Uh, which, as you know, has many um, uh, aspects to them. Um, for example, if you look up ERC-1400 uh, set of standards, you can see uh, they are attempting to, uh, to model uh, real-world securities that are in the regulated space. Um, a token can either rep represent value. Uh, those would be uh, fungible tokens. Fungible means one token is exactly the same as the next token, uh, just like currency. Uh, they can also be representing global uniqueness uh, in the form of non-fungible tokens. So every token uh, is unique uh, from every other token. Um, there are many token designs and implementations. Uh, a lot of them have been battle tested uh, by uh, being launched in the uh, public networks and being responsible for securing uh, sometimes multi-billion dollar worth of value. Uh, there's a popular term you may have heard of, uh, total uh, locked value, um, 
which represents how much value a particular smart contract, for example, on Ethereum, is responsible for uh, in that particular uh, con uh, construct uh, for for token. So this makes it. Uh, this should make enterprise feel safe when they adopt a token implementation because if there are any flaws, they would have been discovered because um, a public network uh, having a flaw is very easy to be a, a target for hackers. So the fact that they've been uh, um, uh, responsible for a large amount of value for a long time is proof that uh, it's very high quality. Uh, just as as an example of a of a token, um, USDT um, <clears throat> is a stable coin on Ethereum. It's a ERC twenty implementation. ERC twenty is one of the simplest token standards uh, as a fungible token. Has a market value of uh, thirty two billion uh, as of uh, the writing of this documentation. So. Tokens is being adopted in enterprise space uh, for many, from many angles. Uh, for example, banks, uh, their customers come to, come to them often with a custody need. Um, when I have a wallet that I'm responsible for and I have a couple uh, Ethereum uh, or Bitcoin in there, uh, I may be comfortable um, you know, managing the key myself, but as my portfolio keeps growing, the value continues to rise. Uh, at some point, I may feel uh, a need for someone else to look after that value. Uh, so in case I misplace my key, I won't lose all that. So banks will have a need to provide a custody service. Um, so both to uh, for safe, safekeeping purposes, but also for earning interest on that, on that value. Um, Consumer brands, they are very interested in token standards uh, because they want to launch uh, NFTs uh, for their unique designs and their, uh, for uh, growing their brand um, in the virtual space. Uh, one of the most popular NFT uh, ecosystem is NBA Top Shot. Uh, sales, uh, accumulated sales have uh, surpassed $1 billion. So that's value that's, that's generated in the past year also that uh, was never there before. So it's net new value that's generated just because of the NFT uh, technology. Uh, healthcare. Uh, healthcare insurance consortiums can use fungible tokens as an incentive uh, to share, uh, improve uh, data quality. So this is one of the sample uh, use cases that uh, one of uh, the Clido customers had is, which is a uh, health healthcare insurance consortium. consortium. Uh, one of the uh, year-long uh, challenges for them was making sure their um, healthcare provider information is high quality, information about the uh, about the uh, uh, doctors. So when their patients needs to contact their doctor, uh, they didn't have the uh, wrong phone number and wrong address. Um, so the best way to improve the quality is to pull together the, val uh, the data from different uh, vendors and different insurance companies and to encourage the sharing of the data uh, using tokens as incentive is a great way to do that. Uh, Post-trade clearing. Um, uh, DL, uh, to use DLT to make uh, settlements more real time rather than you know batch uh, at the end of the day. Um, as an example, DTCC, uh, which Bob um, mentioned earlier, uh, announced uh, the project Ion, uh, in, which is finally in parallel production after um, a long uh, period of exper uh, experimentation. Uh, in August this year uh, and has uh, processed uh, a large amount of value through this new uh, DLT-based system. Web3 startups is another um, uh, adop adopter, early adopter of uh, token uh, uh, technologies. 
Um, they want to use DLT uh, to provide a new ecosystem for doing DeFi, uh, decentralized finance, so that uh, regular people uh, can participate in financing uh, activities, uh, which um, before blockchain is not po uh, possible uh, because of the high threshold to entry. Uh, as an another example, Finality, which is a company based in London, um, just won uh, UK regulators' approval as a new regulated payment solution provider. So that's a key milestone for that company. And you can see uh, mainstream adoption of uh, to token technologies. Token bridges, this is another uh, very uh, critical component uh, for uh, the blockchain space in the enterprise uh, side. Um, token bridges is part of the uh, bigger umbrella called cross-chain interoperability. There are other types of uh, interop technologies and token bridges is one of the most mature and uh, one of the popular uh, solutions for that. So. Um, what this does is um, we talked about uh, blockchains uh, solving silos issues, but we still have blockchain themselves being silos because you have Ethereum as one silo, you have Solana as another silo, you have Avalanche as yet another silo. Um, and you often have a need for digital assets to, to go from one to another. Um, for example, I want to use my uh, Ethereum uh, to invest in a Solana because there is a great uh, DAP that's been developed on Solana. How do I participate in that but invest uh, in my, uh, from my Ethereum portfolio? Uh, or sometimes when you uh, need to pay for NFT that is minted in the sidechain uh, in ecosystem, how do I pay for that with my uh, Ethereum holdings? So things like that all involve uh, digital assets or uh, state to travel from uh, one chain to another chain in a secure and seamless way. So um, assets can do this uh, transfer in different fashions, right? Uh, sometimes it's a clear transfer where I need to take it out of circulation in the source chain, and then I, I put it into circulation on the target chain. Sometimes it's sort of a swap or exchange where uh, parties do payment in one way and then in one chain and then do delivery in the opposite direction in another chain. So it's sort of a, a swap uh, between two chains. So bridges are typically secured uh, smart contracts uh, that require multiple approvals before actions are taken. So most of the uh, popular implementations of uh, uh, token bridges have smart contracts on both the source uh, and the target. Um, <clears throat> and there's a, <clears throat> there's a relay component that acts in between to listen for events and um, uh, take actions. Um, besides tokens, general purpose uh, bridges can coordinate state uh, transfers between uh, two systems. So not just tokens, uh, but uh, if you have a uh, smart contracts that has custom state, uh, those can be uh, monitored and act upon uh, in the different blockchain through the bridges. Uh, I won't have time to go into details uh, on this chart, but um, this is a typical uh, setup of a blockchain across two ecosystems. So in this particular example, I have an enterprise DeFi that's um, built in the side chain uh, on the right-hand side. And then I'd like to integrate with a layer one, for example, Ethereum, uh, on the left-hand side through the bridge. So you would have someone who have accounts on both sides uh, and a smart contract uh, on either side so that this, um, the events that happen on one, one hand can be coordinated through the uh, token bridge so that the corresponding action can be taken on the other side. Uh, for example, uh, when uh, 
when, when I have a large amount of uh, Ethereum that I like to uh, invest in this sidechain ecosystem because uh, whoever built the DeFi uh, is very smart and knows the, the, the market and it's a very lucrative business that I like to participate in, you would <clears throat> deposit your Ethereum through the bridge. So the contract sensing that someone deposited uh, some amount of value will then mint a corresponding value into the uh, sidechain ecosystem. So now you have exchanged your Ethereum to a token that you can use on this side, and then you can invest. Let's say at some point your proceeds uh, accumulated enough and you like to uh, cash out, um, <clears throat> you can do a withdrawal and that would be a burn on this side and again the bridge will sense the the burning uh, event and then will release the fund that was previously locked here and you take out what uh, uh, more ethereum than you have uh, deposited earlier so uh, that's what a token bridge looks like um, the next component i like to uh, cover is wa advanced wa wallets so as more and more value uh, go into uh, enterprise-based uh, blockchains, um, key management becomes a critical uh, component. So you want all keys to be uh, highly secured, um, managed, securely managed, uh, and you also want certain transactions to have multiple signatures. So no one uh, rogue uh, actor can uh, can steal the money and run away. So multi-party compute uh, is a cryptographic um, technique that allows a common uh, out output to be computed across multiple parties and no single party has the whole truth uh, in the end. Every party produce only partial truth, uh, the whole truth only comes out at the very end. So this is a great way to make sure that no single party holds your private key that has the power to unlock the value on blockchain. So MPC-based wallets is very uh, secure in that way. Uh, it's a great way to uh, manage your keys and it's a great way to, um, uh, to do multi-signature flows. Uh, so it's very popular within the crypto exchanges that have to hold huge amount of um, uh, digital assets. Uh, but also banks providing digital assets uh, custody, which also needs to manage huge amount of assets, uh, will find this very useful. Last slide before I hand over to Tracy is hybrid blockchain. Uh, you will hear more about this uh, in other uh, sessions. This is when uh, enterprises use a mix of public chain and, and private chain together. It's somewhat similar to this kind of setup uh, where uh, you use a gas-free chain uh, to do the majority of your transactions because who wants to deal with you know, gas fee fluctuation on a you know, minute by minute basis, right? That's a lot of headache you, you want to avoid if possible. Uh, and in general, a gas-free chain running more efficient uh, consensus algorithm gives you a higher throughput compared to the public chains. Uh, and in addition, you don't have to hold crypto, which you know, to most, uh, a lot of industries is a problem, especially the regulated industries. Uh, it's also desirable to allow digital assets to flow in and out of the uh, ecosystem built around the gas-free chain. Um, so having a hybrid chain set up, you can have values flow uh, securely and seamlessly between the public and the private. With that, I'll hand over to Tracy. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> All right, am I on? Everybody can hear me? Okay, good. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, just a bit of background about myself. I've already spoken, but uh, I currently work for Accenture. Uh, I got involved in the blockchain space back in 2015 uh, when basically IBM introduced Open Blockchain Platform, which eventually became Hyperledger Fabric. My manager at the time came to me and said, hey, there's this new thing. Can you check it out? Uh, as part of the strategic architecture team, and I said, sure, let's take a look at it. thought it was so interesting that I moved over to the Linux Foundation where I worked for 
a couple years as a community architect at Hyperledger and uh, have since moved to Accenture where I focus on this day to day. So let's take a look at the rest of the trends that we have within this presentation. Uh, so the next trend that we have is organizational wallets. So we actually have a couple of different things that are happening in the Hyperledger specifically focused on uh, the organization and uh, wallets for the organization. The first one is Traction. Uh, it is a Hyperledger Aries project. It's a digital wallet solution for organizations that focuses on the line of businesses and allowing them to easily integrate Hyperledger Aries into their applications. So without the businesses specifically having to stand up an instance of Akapai themselves. So imagine being able to use Aries without having to set up that instance. Traction provides a service layer to manage those Aries agent instances in a multi-tenancy Akapai deployment. It provides some value added services uh, and future functionality for that will include things like machine readable governance. We also have within Hyperledger Labs the, Hyper the uh, business partner agent. Uh, so this is a opinionated sort of SSI wallet. It's controlled based on Hyperledger Aries uh, and it uses, it, it allows you to verify, hold, and issue verifiable credentials. Uh, so you can attach your public organizational profile to your public DID, and then you can add business partners and connect to those business partners and exchange information about your business with your business partners. The second thing that I'll include here with Trends is the multi-purpose wallet. Uh, so wallets is obviously a, a big sort of conversation that we're having, uh, and we think that, I think you heard it in Melanie's talk, right, where she talked about the fact that we currently today have blockchain wallets that are focused on digital assets, your tokens, your cryptocurrency, or we have blockchain wallets that are focused on verifiable credentials. What if we had a universal or multipurpose wallet that could hold all of your different sort of assets, your financial instruments, your cryptocurrencies, your NFTs, your digital identity, those verifiable credentials, any sort of travel data or loyalty cards that you might have. Uh, so we think this is a place where, um, where we will see some work being done uh, and allowing you to access those wallets through the web, through your mobile devices, uh, through hardware, uh, through VR headsets uh, in the virtual world, and even through your desktop. The next trend we have is rollups. Uh, so rollups are becoming more and more used. Uh, rollups move that computation uh, and your state storage off chain and uh, allows you to keep some data kind of per transaction on chain. So there's a couple of different sorts of rollups that exist. Uh, so optimi optimistic rollups use fraud proofs. The rollup contract keeps track of the entire history of the state and the hash of each batch. If anyone discovers that one of those batches had an incorrect post state root, then they would use a fraud proof to prove that there was an incorrect computation. The contract itself would then be able to verify that proof and revert the batch and all batches after it. There's also the zero knowledge rollups. Uh, these use validity proofs. So every batch would include a cryptographic proof, uh, and that cryptographic proof would be using a ZK snark. Uh, and that would prove that basically the state, the post state root that is stored on the layer one has the correct result of executing the batch. So no matter how large that computation is, the proof can quickly and easily be verified. Interoperability. I think you'll see a lot around interoperability. I noticed there's uh, like 29 different talks on the Global Forum that had something about interoperability either in the title or in the description. Uh, so interoperability is, is obviously a, an interesting space and there's different places where interoperability takes place. Uh, the first sort of interaction that you might have is an interaction with a non-DLT based system. 
the, and this is exactly what we would see when you're integrating with your enterprise systems, your SAPs, your Oracles, uh, anything that you might think uh, exists today within your enterprise. The second type of interoperability that we have is interaction within the same DLT network. So it's running the same DLT protocol, it's the same exact network, um, but you might be interoperating across different sort of smart contracts in that particular blockchain. The next sort of interoperability that we have is interoperability across different sort of DLT networks. So these are still running the same protocol, but it's a completely separate network. So think about a Hyperledger Fabric A network and a Hyperledger Fabric B network and interoperating, interoperating across those different networks. And then the last and probably most complex type of interoperability that we have is interoperability across different DLT protocols. So this is uh, something that may be running Hyperledger Fabric for one of your networks and maybe an Ethereum virtual machine for another network. This is obviously uh, more challenging and, and more difficult. And of course at Hyperledger we have projects that are focused on uh, interoperability, specifically Hyperledger Cactus, uh, and we have some labs that are also focused on interoperability. And then what would a trends presentation be without talking about the metaverse? Uh, so in the metaverse, and, and this is a slide directly from some of our Accenture uh, slide decks that we have, we start thinking about uh, the way in which the internet is being reshaped. So in the 90s, we talked about the internet of data. So there were vast amounts of data that we want to make available to multiple people and allow them to have access to that particular data. In the 2000s, we moved to the internet of people. So connecting ourselves through social, um, social media uh, and be, being able to bring to life those connections with people across the world. In the 2010s, we talked about the internet of things. Those connected devices that we have throughout our houses, uh, our devices that we carry around every day, uh, and connecting those machines together uh, in, in the way that we work. And then with the metaverse, we see the internet of place and the internet of ownership. So bringing together people virtually in the real world and the people who are watching this right now on the live stream. We talk about the internet of ownership where we now own digital assets and verifiable credentials and those are owned by people, things, and organizations. So with that, I think I'm going to call Jim back up to the stage, and we're going to take some Q&A uh, from the audience. Any questions that anybody has? Or maybe share what you may have used um, in, your, in your own business, in your own projects. Did you? Microphone. Any other trends that people are seeing that we missed, that we should have covered? Who are already using tokens in your projects? OK, majority of the people. It's great. Uh, who's onboarded uh, MPC wallets? OK, two? OK. Um, token bridges. Well, token bridges. Any interop components? OK. A bit more. Okay, very encouraging. Let's see, what else? Who have done a uh, hybrid setup from a side chain, permission side chain with a public chain? Wow, okay. Very encouraging. So I think these are the, the trends we've seen uh, definitely in the past year also. Uh, and all these hands are proof that we're, we're, not, we're not joking. Uh, anything that we've missed um, in this in this deck that you think is holds a lot of promise and is very critical to the advancement of the space. Daniel, I'm sure you've you've got a few ideas. Sorry to put you on the spot. 
So this is probably more strictly in the public chain. Um, there is a big Ethereum event happening Wednesday, Thursday. Um, big merge. Proof of work, proof of stake. Yep. So proof of stake and works, I think, are going to be a big thing. And I want to reiterate on the roll-up slide, I think that's going to be another big trend coming in. And another thing we're seeing, um, people are less interested in, well, it's, it's not that they're less interested. It's that the market is a smaller percentage is going for building a level layer one chain. Because there's new market people coming in that say, well, we just need a distributed app. And we don't need to run the entire chain. So with roll-ups, it builds the market, which makes it like the layer one shrinking, when really the whole pie is growing. And there's just a smaller slice. And I think that the, uh, the, the value of roll-ups allows for use cases just as, where it's like, you know, we only have 100 transactions a day. Is that, you know, do we really need a layer one for that? But they, for the decentralization and the non-centralized ownership, it's essential to have it on some sort of a public or uncontrolled chain that, you know, in, you know, in the case of, of a, you know, typical roll-ups, you only need one honest validator to push that batch forward. So, and it can be a very asynchronous and very, you know, they can check in once a week to make sure things are working. And there's, a, I think, a large market for decentralized apps like that, particularly in the uh, decentralized autonomous organization um, type environments where people are trying to basically build LLC governance into the chain. Um, there's going to be legal stuff co coming up with that, but I think ultimately they're going to figure out how to make it work. And a lot of these LLCs, they don't run you know, 100 TPS per second. They run like 100 transactions a week. Um, so there's going to be roles for some of those coming in. I think these are, some of these are important to, to grow to grow into smaller applications that are going to be more numerous, you know, 11,000 parts of Bloom, that don't necessarily need their own layer one, but would want to share a layer one that other people are running on. And, yeah. and to summarize for those who are on video, uh, the merge, Proof of work to proof of stake. Proof of stake uh, going to be very important. Uh, a plus one to the roll-ups is being extremely important and seeing uh, what's going to happen there. And then Dano mentioned DAOs. Um, so I think those are uh, some interesting things. I think we actually had a slide on that. We, we removed a, it for some reason. I don't know. Yeah, but, uh, Enterprise DAO. Um, don't think those are coming to the scene just yet. So I decided to remove it, but just First show of hands, uh, anybody uh, thinking of creating a DAO in their enterprise use case? Wow, I'm impressed. I should have left it in. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate the input from uh, Daniel. Uh, we're a TSC fellow membership, so I thought I, I'm uh, just a bit justified to pick on him. Um, yes, sir. Hi, um, sort of general, very expected question. Um, Paul Hearns from Blockchain Ireland here locally. Um, you mentioned interoperability heard this morning about possibly two ends of the spectrum in terms of CBDCs and then you're, you're talking now about Metaverse. So if, if you look, say, at some of the very established use cases, they're, they're very traditional in terms of um, finance, insurance, things like that. Do you have a sense of interoperability maybe a few years down the line when there are common CBDCs we are seeing some practical implementations of the metaverse beyond sandbox and things like that. And then what's in the middle with, with commercial? Like, do, do you have a sense of how those kind of strands are going to come together in the foreseeable future? Yeah, so just to repeat the question for the people in the video, uh, it's around interoperability, the, the spectrum from CDBCs to metaverse and what's in between and how does this become sort of reality and what do we see happening there. I think there's some really interesting things that can happen. Uh, specifically, I think if we look at the Hyperledger space, we have things that are uh, networks, blockchain networks. Uh, those blockchain networks could be CDBC networks, um, they could be supply chain networks, they could be identity networks. I think in the metaverse, things that are going to be important obviously are payments, right? C that could happen on a, on a blockchain network, either CDBC, stablecoin, cryptocurrencies, I think there could be some really interesting things around proving who we are within the metaverse, right? As we think about doing uh, sort of commerce in the metaverse, how do you know who you're interacting with? Are you interacting with somebody on the metaverse who is, is a known entity, right? Or are you interacting uh, with somebody that you, you uh, don't know, right? And 
the different sort of ways in which you need to be able to prove things about yourself, um, maybe where you're located, uh, even your age, right? Different sorts of uh, attributes that we could think about with verifiable credentials that are, you know, obviously a, a big hotspot with the indie Aries um, aspect of Hyperledger, I think is going to be um, key, right? So as I think about a high level kind of metaverse stack, I think about the network layer that you're going to have. You're going to have the different protocols that are going to have to interoperate across those different sort of networks. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, the, the sort of interaction that you're going to have, right? Not everybody is going to interoperate in world in a, in a mask, right? Um, some of us are going to operate on a desktop and those sorts of things. So I think there's going to be some interesting sorts of things that happen uh, kind of at that display layer. And then what is the ecosystem that you're building within that metaverse, right? Is it, is it focused on commerce? Is it focused on social interaction? What is that focus? And I think there's going to be some interesting things that happen there. Um, but, but definitely I do see a lot of interoperability that's going to come into play when it comes to dealing with the different sorts of networks that you're going to have to communicate with. Yeah, and uh, just to add what Tracy said, from Kaleido's point of view, we worked with quite a lot of um, CBDC projects. And from what we've observed, uh, still early days, um, both, on, both on the uh, retail side and on the wholesale side. Because until you solve the privacy problem, it's not going to be uh, completely comfortable uh, for the participants to, to join uh, in the proper way. Because in the proper decentralized system, you want uh, uh, decentralized ownership, right? It shouldn't be that a CD CBDC DLT is owned by a single organization. That defeats the purpose. But if you want multiple orgs to join, you have to solve privacy properly. And uh, that's, that's going to be a very big challenge. There are some. Uh, projects that specifically focus on this. I think Wubin uh, was one of them, trying to use zero knowledge proof uh, to, uh, to solve a privacy in the cross border um, payment uh, scenario. Um, so there's a lot of lesson learned from that, and then there's still mass uh, uh, adoption uh, in, the, uh, in the near future, hopefully. Um, but it's, it's very uh, it's a very uh, active area that, uh, block, where blockchain is being used. I, I think you know, we'll see standards being developed. Uh, we'll probably see new projects coming into Hyperledger that are implementing those standards. And so I think there'll be a lot of interesting things happening in that space. Thank you for the question. Um, I do know that we are at time. Uh, I think yep. 11.55 was when we were supposed to end. So thank you for attending. And we'll, we'll be here if you want to chat more.